Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us for our online gathering today. We are super excited to have you here with us. We're going to dive in to worship and then we'll have the message. Um, before we do that, I would love it if you'd allow me to pray for you. God, I thank you so much. I thank you for the opportunity to come together as a community, as a family, to hear from you this morning, um, to worship together and worship you. We just honor you and we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. I will see you guys back here after worship and the message. Christ is my firm foundation. The Oh, 
Hi Numa family, today we're going to be looking at a beautiful story told in the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke called The Road to Emmaus. And in this story, there are two disciples who have left Jerusalem soon after the crucifixion of Jesus and they're on their way home to their small town of Emmaus. And it's on this 11 kilometer journey that the recently re resurrected Jesus actually begins to walk beside them, but importantly, for now, they do not recognize him. The tale that follows is a really special one with many lessons that we can learn, including one about discipleship, discernment, and the power of scripture. But to appreciate this story and all the lessons it has to offer, we need to first understand the context within which these two disciples find themselves. And to do that, we need to understand how the Jewish people expected the Messiah to operate and work in this time. You see, most Jews at this time would have thought that the Messiah was going to come as this powerful political and military leader, someone who is going to restore the kingdom of Israel to its former glory under King David. And he was going to do this by casting aside the oppressive regime of, of the Roman Empire and collecting the scattered tribes of Israel. He was going to build a physical kingdom of Israel. There was going to be a time of peace and prosperity, uh, one that the Jewish people hadn't known for generations. And then Jesus begins his ministry and he claims to be this Messiah. He talks about having come to save his people. He talks about the fact that the kingdom of God is at hand. And you can only imagine the excitement that his followers had at, at hearing this news. We can imagine the excitement that these two disciples in the story had as they journey to Jerusalem only a few days before the story starts. And it's within this context that we turn our attention to the two disciples. We don't actually know a lot about them. One isn't even named, and the one that is named, his name is Cleopas. Now, according to both Catholic and Orthodox Church traditions, Cleopas was the uncle of Jesus, uh, the brother of his father, Joseph, and he had a wife called Mary. Beyond that, we know that they were followers of Jesus, not even part of the core 12, but just, I can only imagine the weight of the expectation they had of everything Jesus was going to be. The weight of generations of yet to be fulfilled promises. And it's with these expectations that Cleopas and likely his wife Mary leave their hometown of Emmaus and journey to Jerusalem. And it starts really well. They're going there to celebrate Passover with the Messiah. And on the Sunday that they arrive, potentially, Jesus arrives at Jerusalem and he's met with much fanfare. From Monday through to Wednesday, he preaches in Bethany and Jerusalem. And then on Thursday, they celebrate Passover together. And then, a matter of mere hours, he's betrayed, uh, sentenced, crucified, and he dies. We can imagine that Cleopas and his wife Mary are in the crowd when Jesus is sentenced to death. We can imagine they are there when he is carrying the cross up the hill. And we know from John 19 that Mary, the wife of Cleopas, is at the foot of the cross, comforting her sister-in-law as Jesus takes his final breath. Cleopas and Mary hang around in Jerusalem for three more days, but that only complicates things. The woman who went to Jesus' tomb to finish his burial returned, claiming that the tomb is empty and that angels appeared to them, claiming that Jesus had risen. But by the time Simon Peter gets there, he just finds an empty tomb and, and no angels. So sad and having lost hope, Cleopas and Mary decide to go home. And it's on this journey home that we then pick up the story in Luke 24, verses 13 to 32. Now that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus and seven, uh, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. 
He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? When I was 14 and my brother was 12, we were shipped off to boarding school by our parents, a pretty wise decision on, on their part. And my younger brother went to a different school to me. He went to a primary school and, you know, having arrived at a new school, you always start looking for new friends. And there was a young boy his age there called Mo. And Mo's family lived in Joburg. And they were at this boarding school together. So that meant that Mo needed to, most weekends, spend them with friends in KwaZulu-Natal. I don't remember Mo very well. I maybe met him once. Uh, but I remember him being full of light and life and having come from a Christian home, as did my brother and I, uh, mostly thanks to the hard work of my mother, they had a connection. They had some common ground. Anyway, on one of the weekends that Mo was staying with friends in, in KwaZulu-Natal, he was at a beach cottage. And there was a low wall that separated the beach from the garden of the cottage, about the height of a kitchen counter, I imagine. And as boys tend to do, Mo had climbed onto the wall and he was walking along the wall with his friend and they were sort of messing around. And in a freak accident, Mo misstepped and he fell off the wall and when he landed, he, he broke his neck. I, I remember very clearly, as clear as day, my brother not only struggled with the death of a friend, but he also struggled with the response of Mo's family. At the boarding school that my brother and Mo went to, they had a memorial service and Mo's family flew down from Joburg for it. And Mo's mother just offered one of the most beautiful pictures of love and grace and forgiveness. And she preached forgiveness. And my brother, along with all of his friends, these 12 year old boys sat in those pews and they couldn't understand how this family could praise and thank a God that would let their son, my brother's friend, die. I don't know if my brother will watch this video. I hope he does. And if he does, and if he disagrees with what I think, I hope he tells me. But I think what happened there was that my brother had an idea of who Jesus was. Where he got that idea from, whether it was from church or some other source, but he believed and expected that Jesus was going to protect him from all pain, all hurt, all suffering, and certainly unnecessary death. And so when those expectations weren't met, my brother was filled with hopelessness and, and confusion and questions that weren't answered. And I think it's because of those unmet expectations of who he thought Jesus was, he failed to recognize that in that moment, in that memorial, Jesus was right beside him. Jesus was sitting in that memorial with each one of those boys, just like he was standing next to Mo's mother who was preaching from the front. Have we not been in a similar situation? I know I have. How many of us have had hearts broken, 
plans unfulfilled, unrealized dreams, an illness that goes unhealed? Have we not found ourselves in similar situations with God where we have more questions than answers, more confusion than clarity, more hurt than joy? So that's why this story is so moving. We connect with Cleopas and Mary in the story because we have been on that road to Emmaus. We have been in that situation of having expectations unmet. But it's because Cleopas and Mary had certain ideas of who Jesus was that they failed to recognize he was walking right next to them. And let's be fair. I don't even think those expectations that Cleopas and Mary had were unreasonable. They were actually pretty good expectations. But nonetheless, their human expectations, their self-imagined ideas of who Jesus was, meant that they missed him and could not recognize him. So the next question I have is, how does Jesus seek to restore their hope? How does Jesus seek to take these two disciples that are are wrestling with grief and bring them back to God, bring them back to hope? Well, he does it by taking them to Scripture. We know that Jesus immediately turns to them and he actually starts by rebuking them, which talking about going against expectations, that certainly went against mine. And he starts to tell them that they are foolish and slow, even though they knew who Jesus was. was. They said he was a prophet, uh, powerful in deed and word before God and people. They knew who he was, but they knew him according to how they expected him to be. And so Jesus takes them back to the scripture. And so the lesson that I take from that is a reverence and a respect and a dedication to the word, to God's word, helps us to avoid having the wrong expectations of who Jesus is. If we turn to Scripture, the promises of Scripture of who God is, those are true expectations. Those are godly expectations. Those are great expectations. And they are the kind of expectations that will not be unmet. They are the kind of expectations that can and will be fulfilled. And they are expectations that we find in Scripture. But I think it's really interesting that even after perhaps receiving one of the greatest sermons that we never actually get to experience from the word, it just says that Jesus takes them through everything that Moses and the prophets said. It's interesting that after this sermon, that after this lesson on scripture, they still don't recognize him immediately. So when do they recognize him? Well, the story goes on as I just read that they eventually decide to invite him into their home. And they invite him into their home and it's sitting around the dinner table, breaking bread together. And it's at that moment that they recognize it's Jesus, not on the road, but in the home. I think Jesus was giving us an example of how we are to build his kingdom. When my brother was shipped off to, to boarding school. I was shipped off to another boarding school, an all-boys Christian boarding school. And just like my brother, I had an idea of who Jesus was. I'd gone to Sunday school. I'd gone to church as a kid. I, I knew who Jesus was. At least I had an idea of that. And having gone to an all-boys Christian school, one of the things we had to do is it was compulsory to attend uh, Tuesday chapel services every morning, or every Tuesday morning. And at first, I was quite reluctant to, you know, engage in these services. I had heard they were boring and wasn't expecting much. And I went to these chapel services, and in fact, I found great comfort in them. For a young man who was very lonely and quite, and had very low self-esteem, the message that was preached in chapel about a good and loving father was very appealing to me. And so I listened. And I listened to the scripture that was read. And as a result, I came to learn about Jesus. I came to learn who Jesus really was. And I had to let go of some of my expectations that I previously held. But I didn't yet fully believe. I hadn't yet welcomed Jesus into my heart. Not really. I believed in Jesus up until the point that it was convenient to believe in Jesus. I believed in him because it made me feel slightly less alone but I didn't really know him. I hadn't seen him. I hadn't recognized him. 
at the same time that I'm going to chapel services and I'm going to our uh, annual, not annual, our weekly student meetings in chapel, I also would go to my grandparents' house most Friday afternoons. They lived about 10 minutes away. And my grandparents were former leaders of a local church. And so as I sat around the dinner table with them on Friday nights, sometimes we talk about God. Most of the time, not, in fact. But it was in spending time with my grandparents, eating with them, laughing with them, talking with them. It was in those moments that I came to see Jesus, that I came to find Jesus and that I recognized them. Now, don't get me wrong. The scriptures that I'd heard and the, the theological discussions I'd heard in chapel were as important. If not for those chapel services, perhaps I wouldn't have had the tools to recognize Jesus at my grandparents' table. But it was the two together, and a purely theological discussion didn't get me to meet Jesus. It was the two that got me there. The Jesus that I'd learned about in chapel was the same Jesus I met in my grandparents' home. I think the same thing can be learned from this story on the road to Emmaus. I, for one, am grateful that Jesus does not seek to meet our human expectations. I think if Jesus had met those human expectations, I doubt very much that he would have even been on the road with those two disciples to Emmaus in the first place. Think about it like this. The Messiah that the two disciples expected and had hoped for, he would have been back in Jerusalem wielding a sword and commanding an army from a lofty golden throne. He certainly wouldn't have had the time or even the will to notice two lonely disciples walking home. And he certainly wouldn't have pursued them the way that Jesus did. The Messiah that was expected, the political and military leader, would have not been on the road to Emmaus. The Messiah we got, the humble servant, the one who walked, talked, listened, and challenged these two disciples, the Messiah that accepted an invitation into their home, the Messiah that sat at their table and broke bread with them, that Jesus, that Messiah, is far greater than anything we could have ever hoped and expected for. Because that's the Jesus that sat with my brother during that memorial service for his friend. That's the Jesus that was on the wall with Mo in his final moments. It's the Jesus that sat with me both in the chapel and in my grandparents' lounge as I got to know him. It's the Jesus who doesn't just meet us where we are, but he walks with us on our own journeys. And he walks with us, talks with us, talks with us, challenges us, and restores our hope. That Jesus is far greater than any, anything we could have hoped for. That's the Jesus that breaks bread rather than breaking the backs of his enemy, enemies. I'm grateful that Jesus did not meet humans' expectations. And I'm grateful that he continues to exceed those expectations today. And there's a lot we can learn from the story of the road to Emmaus. There's how human expectations can get in the way of actually seeing who Jesus is. There's the power of scripture and how when we're uh, caught in our, in our lowest moments, in our points of true hopelessness, it's scripture that can take us back to hope. It's scripture that can restore our vision of Jesus. There's the lesson that to build the kingdom of, of heaven means we're gonna need to sit at people's tables in their homes and that we need to invite Jesus into those spaces in order to truly recognize and meet him. And there's the final lesson and perhaps the one that I, I take away the most that the Jesus we got is far greater than anything we could have prayed or hoped for this Messiah the one who pursues us on whatever journey we're on is the God that I serve and the God who pursues each one of us 
Just think about who Jesus even revealed himself to after he was resurrected. He first reveals himself to a group of women who at the time were hardly regarded as a reliable source. And then he reveals himself to Cleopas and Mary, who according to the Gospel of Luke, one of them isn't even important enough to name. They're not even a part of the core 12 disciples. And yet these are the people that Jesus pursues the moment he's resurrected. And if he pursues them in their hopelessness, in their doubt, then he can pursue us as well. And he does pursue us. So let's turn away from our own human expectations and let's embrace the promises of Scripture for who Jesus is. I know that we often have great expectations for Jesus. But I find great relief and comfort and joy in knowing that Jesus will never meet those finite human expectations. But instead, if we give Him the chance, He will always, ultimately, in some way, exceed our expectations entirely. Maybe you have found yourself in a similar situation to the disciples in this story. Maybe you find yourself in that exact situation right now. Well, I certainly did and still do from time to time. And if you would like to find out and want to get to know Jesus more so that you can recognize Jesus, that He's with you in those moments and walk beside you, we'd love to connect with you and get to know you and I'd love to pray for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the example you gave us in the story of the road to Emmaus. I thank you that you pursued these two disciples in their hopelessness and doubt, just like you pursue us in our hopelessness and doubt. And Lord, I pray that everyone listening who finds themselves in a similar situation, that they will turn to Scripture so that they can come to recognize you and have the accurate expectation of who you are. And that they know, not only do you meet them in that moment, but you are walking right there next to them. Lord, I pray that we will come to recognize you in our moments of doubt and hopelessness. And Lord Jesus, I pray for anyone who does not yet know you and has not yet recognized you, that they will have the courage and the strength to ask for help, to get connected, so that they can start afresh and begin a new journey with you at their side. Amen. So if that's you, if you're watching this and you would like to get connected, there are three ways you can do that. The first is somewhere on the screen, I've been told a number is going to pop up, a WhatsApp number, so you can reach out to Numa Life through that number. The second way is on our website. I don't know, maybe there's a link here. Maybe I'm not uh, here, maybe not. But there's a link to the website. You can click on that link and, and find out more or go to that link. And then the last way is in the chat, maybe here, could be so wrong. There's a chat here. Uh, there will be someone from Numa in the chat and you can just chat with them and get to know them. Um, but, but ultimately, you don't need to walk your journey alone. Wherever you're walking to, even though it's not Emmaus, wherever you're walking, not only is Jesus gonna walk with you on that journey, but we want to as well. So I encourage you to reach out. Um, I'm glad that I once did reach out to Numa and it's been great. Thank you for listening. Uh, have a blessed rest of your day. As we transition into our time of giving, I just want to say thank you guys so much for your generosity and giving of your time, of your talents, your resources, your finances. It's because of you that Numa Life is able to do the things that we're able to do here in the city of Cape Town. So as the banking details pop up on the screen, I would love to pray for us in our giving of our time, our talents, and our resources. God, I thank you so much. I thank you for the opportunity to give into what you're doing in the city of Cape Town and in our nation. Um, we are so thankful um, that we get to play, yeah, just a small part in the big picture that you have for us. And we just honor you and we thank you for the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. 
And I just have two announcements for us this week. The first one is we are looking for life group hosts. If you are interested in opening up a space that would allow people to come in and experience community, experience family, and get cared for as part of the NUMA family, we need you. So DM us, send us an email, um, or visit the website and fill out a contact form and we'll follow up with you. And then secondly, we need people who are passionate about children to help us out in our kids' ministry. It's not like an every Sunday thing, guys. It's whenever you're available, we just are looking for people who are passionate about the next generation and helping build their foundation as they journey um, in relationship with God. So if that's you, if you've got one Sunday out of the month, one Sunday out of the term, one Sunday even out of the year that you would be willing to give to volunteering kids ministry, hit us up, send us a DM, send us an email. Um, we'd love to connect with you and, and get you started on that journey. Other than that, have an amazing day and week further, and we'll see you guys next week.